and we are back on the Zero Hour. I am, of course, your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. And joining us once again is a good friend of the program and a good friend of working people everywhere, economist and author Richard Wolf. Uh, he is the host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV every Tuesday evening. He is the author of a new book, which we will discuss next time after I'm done reading it, entitled The Sickness is the System, which I very much Look forward to um, exploring in depth with him. And um, first of all, Richard Wolf, have I left anything off I should have mentioned about uh, you and what you do? No, I think people know us by now and uh, uh, don't need a reminder. Yeah, I think they pretty much got the idea. Um, so let, let's start with this, uh, Rick Wolf. The, um, a lot of talk nowadays and some pushback you've come on the program and talked about the idea that um capitalism uh, especially in this country might be uh at the start of at the beginning of uh, a long-term decline or somewhere in that process uh there are people who are pushing back on that notion this is arguing that this is a temporary blip, so our topic can be reality or not, uh, is a long-term decline in U.S. capitalism now underway, which sounds like a debate topic. I'm not necessarily going to debate you on that, but uh, your thoughts on uh, whether that is in fact a reality or whether we're just experiencing a blip or a hiccup. Yeah, well, it's interesting, I think, perhaps for people to, to know that this is not a position that I've held for a very long time. Um, I have been impressed most of my life by the res resilience of capitalism, that despite uh, two world wars fought among capitalist countries, uh, trying to divide and redivide the world uh, amongst them, uh, both World War I and World War II, uh, the Great Depression, and a host of other problems, this system has demonstrated considerable resiliency. And even though that was also true of feudalism before and slavery before that, um, it was a caution for me and led me to be very hesitant about uh, any kind of long-term prediction or any kind of notion of a of a decline in the in the long term sense. So it's relatively recently that as I look around asking myself, how is this system going to prove to be resilient again? How are we going to get out of the multiple dead ends that American capitalism has uh, driven itself into? And in recent months, I must say, and I freely admit I'm impacted by the pandemic on top of everything else, I don't see ways out. I don't see where the kinds of possibilities that enabled resilience in the past are showing up to enable it again. So let me be specific. As I look around, I see that the capitalist system's instability, its periodic every four to seven year on average crash, this bizarre quality uh, in which every four to seven years, wherever capitalism has settled around the world over the last 300 years, it exhibits this kind of crash. Here we are in the first 20 years of the of the new century and we've had a crash of the dot com in 2000 the subprime mortgage 2008 and now the covid crisis three crises 20 years there it is again the four to seven year average um everything has been tried to get out of this periodic recurring crash nothing has worked uh, the last uh, dozen presidents have all said, I will have a set of policies to put before you, speaking to the American people, 
that will not only get us out of the current crisis, but make sure that we do not leave an unstable system uh, to our children and our children's children. Every president promised it. No single president has ever delivered it. Here we are uh, in the current year with one of the worst crises in our history, second only, and who knows if it'll stay in second place, but second only to the Great Depression in terms of its devastation. I mean, this is a system that has proven itself incapable of overcoming its own horrific, costly uh, instability. Now, my second one is closely related. Up until now, that instability was heavily offloaded from the majority of the population, basically white people and above all white males, onto everybody else. Other people were the ones who lost their job first when the economy went down and who were hired back last when it went up. You know, the last hired, first fired what I call the shock absorbers, the people who had to live out the instability in a big way to enable the rest of the system to avoid it. And, you know, I don't think we would have had capitalism even this long if every one of us listening to this program, you, RJ, and myself included, if we had had to worry that every four to seven years our jobs were at risk, our income was at risk, How do you buy a house and undertake a mortgage under those circumstances? How do you pay for an education if you're going to be subject to this kind of a risk? How do you live your life? I don't think the mass of people would have accepted the instability of capitalism had it not been effectively said to them, don't worry, you're white, you're male, and you will mostly keep your job. It'll be the African-American, the immigrant from uh, Latin America, the female, and 100 years ago, the children who will be the last hired, first fired, the, the, the people who are the shock absorbers of a system that is so badly wired that it shocks you every four to seven years. I don't see that African-Americans are willing anymore to play that role. I don't think women are willing to play that that role. I think that the Me Too movement, that the Black Lives Matter movement, these are very powerful assertions by major shock absorber groups that they've had it with that role, that they will not tolerate it anymore. And I don't think this system can survive. I I, I don't want to take too much time, but... I think those fires, I read this statistic a few days ago, that more acreage has been lost to fire in the state of Oregon alone than is the total acreage of the state of Connecticut, where I've lived most of my life. I mean, what are we talking about? Climate change is staggering in its consequences. You know, I'm a person who likes to drink California wine. I'm getting reports from wine producers all over California that the fires are damaging the grapevine. It's are damaging a very important business uh, for that state and for the country as a whole. Uh, I'm watching the disintegration of America's alliances. Mr. Trump and the Republicans are destroying the connections with Mexico and Canada, with Europe and India and and Latin America, and above all, with China. This is an extraordinarily foolhardy, dangerous game here. China is a serious competitor of the United States. Most Americans have to stop imagining that the United States is in a position to push the Chinese around. It isn't working. And it's not going to work. It's not that you can choose between cooperation and competition. You don't have that luxury anymore. 
if crushing the Chinese was ever an option, it is now way too late. That genie is out of the bottle. That horse is out of the barn. You either come to terms with the Chinese or you're looking at a global system divided between the U.S. on the one hand with poorer alliances with its former allies than it has had in half a century versus the Chinese, whom everyone can see is the up and coming new economic powerhouse. I mean, I could go on, but I think you're getting the, the feeling, I hope, of the accumulation of issues that this country has not resolved, that are internal, the growing number of new problems it's created for itself externally, and the fact that our economic system is more crippled by this pandemic than almost any other economy in the world. The United States has 4.5% of the world world's population and 25% of the COVID cases and the COVID deaths. That is a stupefying failure for a rich country to have been so unprepared and so incapacitated to contain. And then to watch the leadership confronted with these problems and all it can do is a kind of childlike tantrum of rage, calling the, the pandemic a Chinese flu. Let me remind everyone, the last time we had a pandemic like this current one was in 1918. It happened to be a pandemic that started in a U.S. Army base in the state of Kansas. No responsible politician, and if memory serves, no politician of any kind, thought to call it the American flu. It actually got the name Spanish flu because the Spanish were the only mass media market that was uncensored enough to actually talk about the flu. Most other countries censored uh, information about the flu. So Mr. Trump's rageful denunciation of the Chinese to cover over his abject failure to prepare for or contain the virus. These are the behaviors of a ship going down. And I've gotten the feeling, and I say this purely as an American citizen born and lived all my life here, I think we're facing a system that is in fact declining and that more and more we're going to recognize that the real options we face are whether to change this system to stop its further decline or to risk being taken down, all of us, with it. So, uh, Richard Wolf, uh, you've said a, a lot there, and I, I want to uh, you know, address a couple of points and then maybe talk about root causes a little bit. Uh, First of all, this Chinese virus business, besides being outrageously racist, um, I don't know if you agree with this. I wrote about it and said it would be more ac accurate to call it a capitalism virus since the vectors of transmission were, or a globalism virus, the vectors of transmission were business people traveling from China to Europe, to New York, to you know various places around the world. So it was not the ethnicity of or of the region of origin that transmitted it so quickly. It was uh, our economic system, but a more, perhaps more to the point, if we talk about uh, a system that had uh, long exhibited resilience and now is losing that resilience and, and is arguably in the state of decline, the obvious question is, is why? And to me, I've thought about that question myself, and it it struck me, it has struck me, that um, the analogy that's come to mind is that of a, 
uh, a black hole or singularity in astronomy where a star can exist for millions of years, but once a certain balance of forces is lost, it, it, its gravitational pull becomes impossible to resist. It just uh, collapses and there's no way out of it into you know something that alters the shape of space and time. And it seems to me that the gravitational force that's been unleashed here without a balance is greed and power and the centralization of wealth, the centralization of political power, oligarchy, and that once that reaches a certain point, that inward collapse into a little black hole type state or utter destruction may be irreversible. But that's my theory of what, you know, I I sometimes wonder we're see if we're seeing uh, what would you say uh, would be a perhaps a more less poetic and more um, uh, analytical way of uh, looking at what we're observing right now? Well, you know, I, I don't want to take anything away from what you've just said. I, I don't think there's a single or a unique or a major cause for all of this. I think the contributors to every empire's decline were always many, multiple. This or that thing happening, that's what a system can overcome. That's why it's resilient in the face of this or that. It's when there's too many thises and too many thats all at the same time crowding in on you that you can't anymore. Uh, so I'm not, I think what you said is all valid. Um, I'm about to say something different, but not in any kind of contest as which is more important. I don't really believe in any of that. Uh, but let me add uh, another consideration. Um, the history of capitalism, for example, in the United States, but this, it's the same everywhere. The history of capitalism is a history in which a lot of money can be made in a relatively short amount of time because this system is, is literally fan, fanatically focused on profit. So when they get a profit opportunity, in come the capitalists investing a lot of money, concentrating on milking whatever the situation is for the maximum amount of profit they can get it. Uh, so for example, early on in the history of the United States, New England was the focus. And so fishing in, in the, on the Atlantic was very profitable. So that was focused on. And then farming, not so profitable because the soil isn't so great, but you could get by. Then early manufacturing, taking advantage of reasonably good harbors and the relative nearness of going back to Europe. But here comes the punchline. At a certain point, the profit opportunities in New England became smaller. That by itself could have left the situation okay. But just as the profit opportunities in the New England original area began to atrophy, new possibilities grew in the mid-Atlantic states, in the Midwestern states, and so on. And so capitalism moved. You know, if you travel through New England, you will find, to this day, huge brick buildings, usually three, four stories high, and a, a, a city block long. They're the old mills where early textiles were produced, where early manufacturing happened in America that was very profitable, and that had a lot to do with trade with Europe and, and the Caribbean and so on. But those are now empty. Uh, there are factories that, that sit there uh, growing weeds in their parking lots, if they even have those left. They're abandoned. All over America, we see that kind of movement of capitalism. And you see it not only regionally from New England to elsewhere, but even within regions. Nothing is more dramatic right now than literally, and I mean this, tens of thousands of, of malls across America that are empty, that are bankrupt, that cannot survive because the changing profit opportunities make brick and mortar stores disappear and we're all ordering 
from Amazon, etc., etc. Well, why, why do I bring this up? This can happen to a country just as much as it can happen to a region within a country or to an industry within a country. I think it's happening to the United States. I think that capitalism, starting around the 1970s, basically looked around. There were exceptions. Amazon is an exception. High tech in California, Silicon Valley. There are other exceptions. But for the mainstream, capitalism looked around the United States and said, between the wages we pay workers and the prices we can charge in a competitive world economy, where there are much cheaper places to produce, like India, China, Brazil, we can make more profits someplace else. And you begin to see the movement of production out of the United States. And even if you don't see the movement, the decision of an American company where to expand will be in China or in India or in Brazil or in other places, not here. And the jobs begin to atrophy and the system begins to have signs of of decline and decay, like the malls, like New England starting 100 years ago, and so on. So I would argue that the center of economic vibrancy, dynamism, and growth has left large parts of the United States. Not 100%, but for this to be happening, the decline is never 100%. Even in the decline of Britain or the decline of Rome, there were parts of those societies that escaped the decline. But in the large picture, the decline was unstoppable once it got underway. And finally, for me, watching the Trump Republican activity, right up until this week's uh effort by Mr. Trump to explain that he won't leave the presidency, whether or not he wins the election. These are the behaviors uh, of a government that is no longer functioning to manage an economy. This is a government trying not to be taken down by the decline of the larger society that it is powerless to stop. And I think, Mr., the very bizarre quality of our government is itself yet another symptom, like the fires in the West, like the absurd failure to manage this virus, that indicate we are not finding the bases for resilience that we once had, and we better face that because the alternative is way worse. Well, Rick. Richard Wolf, and again, we're talking with economist Richard Wolf, host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV and author of the new book, The Sickness is the System. But let me uh, give you one scenario that's been uh, explored for a kind of post-collapse capitalism in this country. The economist uh, Tyler Cohen has written about this and uh, from personal uh, sources. I know this is a very, very popular among very top wealthy and powerful people in the Silicon Valley. And the scenario goes something like this. And when, when Cohen writes about it, he says, of course, I'm not saying this is good, but he's basically uh, the chief ideologue, I would say, for this, uh, this vision of the future is one where 85% of the population, give or take, lives in near poverty or to put it another way, has no useful employment, no role to play in society. 15% of the population, uh, uh, Thomas Friedman has also echo echoed Cohen on this, or Cohen on this, 15% uh, of the population are above average enough that they can survive or even thrive in the new economy. So the question becomes, uh, perhaps capitalism doesn't die, but this dystopia, uh, that the Silicon Valley billionaires and someone like Tyler Cohen envisions, uh, we've got to find a way to keep 85% of the people uh, 
alive and not, but not uh, threatening our power and not revolting against us. So what's the solution? An internet on which they endlessly click, uh, free uh, accessibility to addictive drugs. And I'm serious, this is part of the conversations that are going on, open accessibility to it, addictive drugs and um, uh, who knows, uh, some s perverted uh, Silicon Valley variation of the universal basic income that gives a meager amount, a $1,000 to everyone, let's say per month, but takes away social services. So they get to scrape by on that however they can. And that's the vision of future, but it is a future where capitalism continues to exist, albeit it's a horror scenario. It's still a future for capitalism. What do you think of that uh, possibility? Yes, I'm hearing that from all corners of the world. Um, it is uh, literally, I, I read yesterday, uh, a brilliant piece along these lines that appeared in an Indonesian magazine. Hmm. Um, I think what you're seeing, and I'm not surprised that it's coming from Silicon Valley, I think you're beginning to see articles like these that are projections forward of trends and tendencies that are already in evidence. And let me be a blunt, brutal if you like, but honest. Um, what you just described is what has been the condition mm -hmm. of a very large number of countries in what we used to call the third world for a long time. You have one or two or three cities. These are enclaves where the wealthy, the, the, the top 5% or 10% or 15%, and that varies from country to country. That's where they live. That's where they have their restaurants and their shopping and the schools for their elite children and all the rest. Those are the cosmopolitan or world cities where you will find the same brand names uh, that you do everywhere else in the world like that. Um, on the edges of those cities live all of the poorer people who are servants of those at the top. And then you have the vast hinterland populated by desperados, poor people. Yes, some of them uh, getting by on a minimum farming or subsistence. Some of them utilizing all kinds of drugs from coca leaves to heroin to you guessed what else it could be. Some of them getting welfare of one kind or another, dribs and drabs a good number of them living on a variety of criminal activities that can make them some money, um, a good number of them leaving every year uh, to go find work somewhere else where it is more available. They then become the servants of the rich in some foreign city. This has been going on a long time. This picture of what the United States might be is a pretty good description of what already is and has been for a long time. But the interesting question that your sketch poses is can you do that to a society like the United States that not only has known something different, but prided it itself? I don't think I'm going too far by saying the 20th century, or at least the second half of the 20th century, was a time when the United States, the official ideology put forward by the Republicans and Democrats, by, by ideologues from the left to the right, was that the United States was an exceptional place, a place where everybody was in the middle class. Yes, there were a few super rich and a few terribly poor, but you didn't have to worry about them because they were such a small part of it. For the rest of us, we were all in some middle class and we could all indulge the conventional Republican Party and the conventional Democratic Party. You know, the Clintons on the one hand and the Bushes on the other and all the other, this, this middle of the road, boring and we could have 
you know, a government of the Republicans for a while, and then the Democrats, Tweedledum, Tweedledee, not big difference, um, and it would all be this way forever. Well, we don't have that anymore. Starting in the 1970s, the gap between rich and poor resumed, looking like what it did in the 18th century and the 19th and the first half of the 20th. We're going back to being very unequal. But the real question, I think, for the United States is whether a mass of people, given the taste for quote-unquote middle-class life, or you might call it the American dream, or you could give it a, a lot of names, college education for your children, your own home, your own car, a two- or three-week vacation, or maybe even longer, these things as part of life, these are all being taken away. You know, the irony of the pandemic is that they're being taken away faster. You know, higher education is disintegrating. My colleagues and I, we cannot teach at a distance. We would have had to reconfigure the university so we could teach smaller classes, which we've always wanted to do because you learn more in Instead, we're all teaching massive classes, limitless classes, because you're not there anymore. You're doing it at a distance. And you, you can fake it from morning till night. You're not educating people the way you once did. And that's true in kindergarten, and that's true in the PhD program. You could not have gotten away with crunching public education for the masses the way we're doing in a regular society. The pandemic is becoming the kind of event where a jokester might say, never let a terrible pandemic go to waste. Make it useful for the further diminution. That's why the Republicans are able to say at the end of July, we're not going to give you an extra $600, you 20 million, 30 million unemployed people, to get you through this pandemic. We gave you that until July 31st. Now, get used to it. You're not going to get it. You're going to have to adjust to the kind of life that your description earlier, RJ, laid out. I think we're watching all of these evolutionary processes come together and I just want to be the one to say, when you notice all of the thises and thats piling up, that's when a problem you could overcome to show your resilience changes into yet another problem that adds up to system decline. Which I guess I would just close by saying makes it incumbent on you and me and everybody listening to make sure that uh, should that come to pass, whatever comes next is better than what we have now. So that's right. That's the focus we have to have. We have to have the courage to call it like we see it. Let other people evaluate what we have to say, make up their own minds, but begin to seriously discuss where we go next so that we are not dissolved as this system. If I, I could say one last thing, a reminder, sure. you've heard me say it before. Every system in the history, the thousands of years of history of the human race, every economic system, tribal, uh, clans-based, slavery, feudalism, everyone has shown the same, same pattern. The system is born, it evolves and changes over time, and then it dies and passes away. Capitalism has no reason for us to believe it will demonstrate a different pattern. Capitalism, we know, was born. We know where and roughly when. And we know that capitalism has changed since it was born. We know that pretty well. We've studied it pretty thoroughly. That means that the next stage is the passing away. It's really not a question of weather. It's a question of when, and we're beginning to see the signs that allow us to answer that question, 
And we shouldn't do it with terror. We should do it with the anticipation of coming up with something better. Capitalism was proud that it was better than the feudalisms and slaveries it replaced. And we have every right to expect that the human race can do better than capitalism, especially as that system so badly functions in our own lifetimes. Well, we'll have to leave it there, unfortunately, but as always, Richard Wolf, uh, a great pleasure speaking with you, very enlightening, and as always, thanks for coming on the program. My pleasure, RJ, and my congratulations that you have the kind of program that can ask and discuss these questions. It's an enormous public service. Thank you, my friend. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.